My name is Roland, and my last name is Leader Andrews. And this handout on the back of um, my contact information. So please feel free to give me a call if any of your uh, questions. Um, I don't answer them tonight as we don't get a chance to talk. But the, the type of attorney that I am is, uh, I guess I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, about myself first. Um, I grew up here in Austin and uh, uh, lived here all my life, except for law school. I went away to law school in uh, Dallas and then uh, in Washington, D.C., but I came back here as soon as I could, basically, after I graduated. And I've practiced here for about 15 years and uh, in the area of securities law. Um, and so really representing businesses, what I tell people, like the, the way I describe it is um, you know, if you want to start a business, you want to sell a portion of your business, if you want to buy a business, if you want to sell your business, all your business, I can help you do that. That's the kind of attorney I am. I sit at a computer drafting contracts all day. I, I went to court today, one of the rare instances where I, I have a, a one criminal law client but it's very rare that I'm in the court. Typically, I'm just drafting contracts, drafting all the things that I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and this, the handout that I gave you is, is really an update from, um, I guess it was a year and a half ago, March of 2013, uh, when, I, when I came here last. And, and there have been some changes in the securities laws. I mean, securities law uh, really sort of, it, it's one of those areas of law that, that um, kind of remained unchanged for a while, but then recently, and you've probably heard a lot about you know, crowdfunding, maybe even the uh, opportunity to advertise now to investors. And, and that's what <coughs> this is really about. This is kind of, I saw this as an update to the presentation that I, I gave last time I came here. And when I was here last in March 2013, I, I put together this 30 page presentation, really studious. I've never really done anything like this before, it's maybe obvious. Uh, this is the second time for me to be talking to a big group like this. But, um, you know, I, I think I, what I did is I prepared a presentation that was geared towards a law school <laughs> you know, class. Um, and so when I, when I was talking to Chanel about this last week, um, I, I told her, you know, I, I really feel like what I did last time just kind of went over people's heads. I mean, it was good information, valuable information. I can give you my presentation. I've got a copy of it over there. I was going to use it a little bit. But, um, yeah, I really want to make this relevant to uh, what it is that you're doing, and and, and what I did, I, I I tried to think about that last time, but <coughs> excuse me, it's weird having my mic on. You know, I, I just imagine that the people in this group are are thinking. I was just talking with with Victor and Gina just a second ago about um, doing a number of things. When when you're thinking about talking with somebody like me, you know, and, and she knows talked about raising capital, raising money that you're going to go out and use to invest. Um, there are a couple different scenarios, and one may be, you know, I'm Larry, I'm rolling. Hey, you're a real estate investor. You and I are going to partner up. You know, we're going to be 50-50. I'm going to bring you cash. You're going to bring cash. We're going to go out and find a house, invest in it, lease it, whatever. But we're all, we're going to be, um, you and I are going to be engaged in the management of the enterprise. We're going to make all decisions. If we don't agree, you know, then, then we have to think about what we're going to do. But, but, you know, that's one scenario that I kind of imagine here. And then another, another scenario would be that Larry and I form a partnership and we go out and try to find investors. And you know, we've got this great property, we've got you know, $500, but we need 50,000. And so we know Shanoa, she's really, you know, she's smart and wealthy, maybe made money, not in real estate, this is a hypothetical imaginary Shanoa, oh. but um, <laughs> she just, she's in, from the tech world, she's got money to invest and she knows Larry and I, and so she's gonna invest her money with us. We're gonna take that money, we're gonna go out and buy a piece of property with it. Whatever, however, we, you know, whatever we're gonna do with it, fix it up, uh, lease it out, buy and, buy and hold, you know, whatever we can sell to that investor. Really, that's the idea. So, you know, a couple different scenarios where you've got a partnership where both of the, the people, the investors are really managing the enterprise. And then another scenario where you've got, you know, Larry and I came together and really we're the general partners now. And then we bring in the investors, they're our limited partners. Um, and, and they're passive and they expect us to go out and do all the work. Somehow we're gonna figure out how we're compensated for that. But uh, that's really what I do is put, put together those agreements. And, and when Larry and I form a partnership, 
Larry and I are partners. We both have partnership interests in the partnership. Those partnerships, partnership interests are just like shares of stock, which are securities. And so um, you can have shares of stock in a corporation, you can have partnership interests, limited liability company membership interests, those are all securities. And, and just kind of depending on how, who your investors are and how the, the business is run really influences how I'm gonna tell you how to comply with the securities laws. And so when you have this division between management and, and ownership, um, you know, one of the things I talk about a lot is, is knowing your investor, that's really important, but then also disclosing what it is that you're gonna be doing to your investor. And so um, those are two of the big considerations, but I'm gonna go back to my outline a little bit and, and um, talk I guess first about this idea, a really important concept in the securities laws is the notion of who an accredited investor is. And um, I, I promise I won't come back to the presentation in just a second, but um, have, have any, anybody in here, show of hands, do you know what I'm talking about when I say accredited investor? So quite a few of you do. If you don't, it's okay, it's kind of an arcane securities law term, but um, Basically, it's, it's wealthy investors who securities regulators believe, um, and so securities regulators being like the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, each state has its own securities regulator, so the Texas State Securities Board. They look at these wealthy investors as people that can fend for themselves. They've made their money, supposedly they're smart enough to know that you know, if they give their money to Larry and I, you know, they, they're gonna watch after Larry and I. If Larry and I do something wrong, then they're gonna sue us. They've got the wherewithal to go out and hire an attorney. Um, and so that's one thing that, that you should really think about. If, if you are, you know, whatever position you're in, um, if, if you're going out and raising money from, I forget, I can't stand over here. If, if you're going out and raising money from passive investors, um, it's really best to work with those people, honestly, because you have more flexibility. The securities laws give you greater flexibility in terms of what you can do. Um, and, and, and it's actually probably a good thing to be working with those people because when they go to see you, when something goes wrong, the court's gonna look at them and say, hey, you're accredited. You, know, you, you have the wherewithal to fend for yourself. These guys were honest. They told you everything that they were gonna be doing with your money. Um, you know, they, they gave you this presentation at the beginning of the deal. They gave you the partnership agreement. They went out and showed you the property. You know, you came by and man, you know, visited them with the office, whatever it is. So, so really, you know, they, I mean, they, they did what they told you that they were going to do. And they, they discharged their duties to you. Um, so that's, that's the one scenario. That's where Larry and I are going out and forming a partnership and selling the limited partnership interest that you know, the wealthy investor who doesn't know anything about real estate but knows that Larry and I know what we're doing. And, and she's investing in our knowledge about the business. Um, so, so that notion of who an accredited investor is and, and investing with Larry and I. But then on the flip side, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these, and, and so going back to the specific definition of, of who an, an accredited investor is, it's a definition that's found in, in a SEC regulation, and you have to have at least a million dollars in net worth, excluding the value of your principal residence. And that's a recent change in the law. Uh, it used to be that you could include the value of your home in that calculation, but you can't anymore. That's probably a good thing because uh, what you have is investors coming in thinking that they're, they're really smart because they had a million dollars net worth but it was all tied up in their home, maybe a $200,000 IRA, but they really didn't know what they were doing. And so changing that definition probably in the end restricts the kind of investors who are going to invest with Larry and me, the investors that probably do need some kind of protection from the securities laws. Um, you know, it kind of narrows that kind of <coughs> but, um, there's another way that you can qualify to be an accredited investor, and that's uh, if you have $200,000 of income or $300,000 of annual income with your spouse and a reasonable expectation of making that, that amount in the future. And so um, that's individuals, companies, businesses have different standards. Uh, generally, it's like $5 million. You have to have $5 million in net worth if you're a company and you want to be an accredited investor and invest with Larry and I. And the, no, sure. Okay. Uh, 
Um, just keep going. I'm just <laughs> Um, so, so, you know, we're talking about the accredited investor standards and, and you know, I, I, I think about, you know, just in the average population, I've never seen a statistic about, you know, how, what percentage of the population is accredited investor, but I'm, I'd imagine that there, there's a large number of people in here that aren't. And, and that's fine. You know, we are, we're all somewhere on our road to financial, you know, success. And, and uh, I, I get encouraged whenever I come here because I think, gosh, you know, I've got so much to learn about real estate investing, but I know that I'm in the right place, and I know that this is a, one of the first steps I need to take to really learn more about it. But uh, in any event, uh, you know, so if, if you're not accredited investor, there's still hope, you know. So I, the accredited investor standard is used in in how you comply with the securities laws, and I'm kind of Going, going away from my outline, so I should probably come back to this, but um, the, the general rule with all securities, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, is that they all have to be registered. And so what that means is that any security that a company forms, I go out and form a corporation with the Secretary of State, and I want to sell shares of stock in the company, the general rule is I have to register that stock with the SEC, with the state securities regulator, where I sell of the, of the people, the states of the purchasers of the securities, if that makes sense. So if all my investors are in Texas, all I have to worry about is the securities board and the SEC. Um, so, um, the general rule is that all, all securities have to be registered. And, and what that means is it's a publicly traded stock, so like Microsoft or Apple. But there's a huge cost in doing that because you have to come, go out and hire somebody like me. Um, and to take a company public, you know, it's, it's probably a quarter million dollars to a million dollars in your legal bill alone. So that's, I mean, if, if you're going out and wanting to raise capital for a, a real estate investment and even a, a massively real estate investment, I mean, let's, let's just take the median home or average home price, let's just say $300,000. You're not gonna invest a million dollars in legal fees to create this, this company to go out and invest in, in one single family home. It's just, it's not, it's not a doable. So, so what the SEC and the state securities regulators have done is they've created exemptions from this rule that all securities must be publicly registered. These exemptions, you've heard of Regulation D, maybe. Um, there are exemptions that say if you if you sell these securities, if you form your company and take on partners and do certain specific things and qualify those people as accredited, then you don't have to register. And so um, the cost for an offering like that, that Larry and I come together, form our general partner uh, entity, go out and sell limited partnership interest, you know, I could do something like that for you probably for about five or ten thousand dollars. We really cooperate, you, you know what you're doing. So, you know, the, the gap between the, the legal fees for a publicly traded company and what I can help you do is huge. But that makes sense, right? Because you're doing, you know, Larry and I think we don't have the cash, we've got a great idea and we've got skills, investment skills, and we're gonna go out, we're gonna raise this money, we're gonna create an investment that's gonna make money for both us and our investors. And, and we're going to be able to do that in a way where, you know, we're going to have to comply with the securities laws, but it's not going to be so prohibitively, prohibitively expensive that, you know, we just can't do the deal because we've got a million dollar legal fee to, to do a $300,000 deal. And so that's, that's what I really help people do is comply with those exemptions. Um, from the securities laws, and, and, and really, if you've ever heard the term private placement, that's what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the sale of private securities versus publicly traded securities. So, um, I guess I maybe stop, and I, I feel like I'm going off into law, law school lecture land again. Um, maybe stop and, and ask if there are any questions, anybody has any questions. So I want to invest in you, Larry, and I'm going to give all of you um, your, say, 260 k and that's going to be for the purchase of the property. All of the money for your rehab is going to come out of your own pocket. I'm going to make it uh, whatever loan, 70% uh, loan to value, <coughs> and my security is going to be that property because then also the market's going up, and that's really all I need. So why can't I just draft my own private promissory note, take the money out of my account or IRA, 
That's a, a, How could you draw? Right? A, that's an excellent question. So, so is part of the question like a loan versus an investment in shares of stock or partnership that's right, interest? Okay. There's an LLC. Right. And I'm an LLC. Right. Or an individual IRA. And I can just make, you know, I'll turn up that I wrote, I'm attorney vetted. I'm going to loan you that money, and you're going to, because of our relationship, he's going to make sure I get paid. And even if he doesn't, I'm going to sue him, and he's going to give me that property, and that market is still going to go up. By the time it all fits with all these shenanigans and the law, they real still have a commodity that's I, I, I think, I think, no. Well, I, I think what you're saying is, like, I can stand up here today and say, hey, I've got a deal. I need funding. Exactly. I need one person to fund that deal, right? First but position. One, and, and, and so, honestly, I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, you, that's don't, you don't need you don't need Roland for that, right? That's right. But what you do, I mean, you do. Mine. You might. Okay. But when you say like, I'm looking for ten investors for a commercial deal or something, you need this well, guy. That's no, right? this is a, it's that's a really right. good question because yeah. are, are you a, are you a bank? <laughs> no, but I'm a friend. <laughs> okay. Well, so oh, part money. part of it is like what investor expectations are. Like, what what kind of returns are you looking for? Are you investing with Larry and me because we're going off the map and we're doing some crazy gold mine scheme in Arizona? Or are we doing something really conservative? You know, fully lease office. You know, grade A, whatever. You know. I asked for two points. So two, two points. All right, so so we have to think about okay, is that cheap money to us? Is is that or? Is our deal, you know, are we really projecting returns that are going to be able to recover that? I mean, it's all about what we can sell our deal as, really. And, and so it's, it's, it's about, you know, what kind of company do we have? What kind of returns do we really expect to generate to where we're going to be able to pay you back and then also make money for ourselves? And for a huge growth opportunity, you know, the, the startup, uh, I started my career here in 2000 working in the tech boom and you know all these crazy <coughs> internet companies right being funding on on crazy ideas and everybody gets an arrow of what are those chairs called arrows or, um, yeah right exactly um uh, so huge growth potential supposedly you know you're going to go public in, in a year and you're going to have 10x you know, the amount that you invested um you know that with real estate i mean i guess there there could be instances but that's that's probably really rare you know real estate's pretty conservative more conservative and so maybe debt makes more sense because um you know you, you do have the security of of the piece of property you know that if larry and i flake on you then you can take that and hopefully it's, you know maintain the value so so that's really the answer to your question sometimes you want to use debt and sometimes you want to use equity and um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but it, it's it's really you, you have to look at what the company is going to do, what kind of returns you're going to be, what what you expect to be generating, and then what your investors are expecting. Because if you're a, a pension fund, you know you're looking <coughs> to generate. I mean, if you make six to eight percent a year, you feel pretty good. But if you're a twenty year old, you know that has you know the the tech. We made a bunch of money from from his, you know tech, technology ventures, whatever. You know, huge growth potential. He's thinking about those public companies. You know, down the road where he's investing. You know, he wants a high growth opportunity. And and typically with with the equity investment versus debt, you think there's a greater risk, right? Because you can wind up with nothing. But in the end, I mean, probably not with real estate. It's maybe a little more conservative. But um, you know, with the equity investment, you're expecting higher returns because you're taking on greater risk. Hmm. So, yes, sir. So you're saying, like in her example, if you were making uh, returns like in excess of like 30 percent, 40 percent, then paying her 12 percent of two points, that's feasible, and I want to go ahead and do the debt. Yeah. But if it's like me and 10 guys get together and we all got little chunks of change and we want to cobble it together to go ahead and do something, then something like you're saying would be the best way to go. Because instead of going out and get a bunch of debt, we work together, build a little something where everybody has, I guess, shares, and right. then yeah. we move forward on it. No, that's right. Please come up and. <laughs> no, that's great. I could have said something better myself. That's good. And is that the forming of a syndicate, or, or is it? Yeah, I mean, you can do that in a couple different ways. You can form a corporation, issue shares of stock, form a partnership, issue C -Corp. limited partnership interest. Yeah, you can yeah. use C Corp or S Corp. 
Yeah, or a limited liability company and membership interests. So that's exactly right. Um, is there a tax incentive or advantage if, if you are going to be an investor or like a, a company that has a product that they're selling? Is there a reason why you would want that company that you're investing in to be a C-Corp versus an LLC from a tax standpoint? Oh, yeah, that's really that's a really good point as well. Um, so, so there, that's that's one thing you think about. What kind of entity do I want to form? What kind of securities do I want to issue? And and so you have to think about the taxation. There's really two two main ways that entities get taxed. It's either corporate level or typical C corp taxation, where the company makes money and and it's taxed on that, and then when it distributes it out to the shareholders all the shareholders pay taxes on that income that they receive, whether it has dividends or, you know, sales stocks, capital gains, but it's, you'll hear that all the time, that double level of taxation. The other way is partnership taxation, and partnership taxation is partnerships, LLCs, although LLCs can be taxed as corporations, um, and then S-Corps are really taxed. S-Corps are a little different from partnership, taxation, but, but similar enough that for, for our purposes, what happens is the partnership, the company, earns money. It's not taxed on that. It calculates it, though, and, and it makes $100 in a year, and you and I are 50-50 partners. It reports that income to us, and we have to take that income in and put it on our personal income tax return. And what you raise is a really good point because what happens there is, is you know, we form, we're, we're investors in this company. We're allocated this income. That doesn't mean that there's necessarily cash that will go along with that income. And so you may have to pay out of your pocket to hold that investment, the tax bill. And ideally, at the end of the road, you know, you're going to wind up with enough cash when the property sells. Um, to, to pay the tax bill, but, but currently you don't have any cash and you have to use it from other sources. So that's one real important consideration. And uh, in my presentation, my, my, my law school class presentation, that was one of the, the slides was choice of entity. You have to think about, and typically I, I would say ideal, um, most often I, I would imagine like if, if, if we're talking about the things that I imagine you guys may be doing, I would probably recommend 99% of the time, LLC. But, but the, you have to tell people, you know, please know, if we're successful, we're gonna be allocating all the income to you, but we may not have cash to pay out to you in order for you to pay that tax bill. So that's, that's a really important disclosure item to, to your investors in a partnership. The, the, you know, the investor Larry and I are our partnership, we're gonna tell you that. The expenses are shared, you say? Well, that's right. I mean, that's yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yes, sir. Um, my question is maybe more on advertising. Like, if you're looking for an investor, but not not to form a company, but say you have you have a house, you you got a distressed house, and you've done your due diligence, you have bids in from contractors, and you just need money fund that one deal but you don't necessarily want to go and use a standard loan or, or hard money but you just wanted to partner with one person on this one particular <coughs> fix and flip deal okay. like what's the legality of standing up in front of a group like this to, to advertise for that no no that's a really good question and that's really kind of going more towards the, the handout that i passed out one of the more recent developments um, in securities laws over the last uh, year, and I can go ahead and move on. Uh, I was going to maybe say that towards the end, but uh, and I think there was one other question over here. Maybe I saw it again. Yes, uh, not exactly that, but it was getting back to your presentation, and uh, particularly under the Reg D, the 504, 5, and 6 exemptions. Yes, sir. You know, the accredited investor is pretty simple. If you qualify for that, you basically put an ad on TV if you want to. Being a little we'll, we'll talk, yeah. But I would suggest that most of the people that we're going to be talking to are not right. accredited investors. That's right. And so I'd like to hear about the pluses and minuses of 
warnings or the easiness of uh, the Reg D exemption where you can use non-accredited investors? That, that's a great uh, question. And, and uh, there was a, an outline that was put together by the Security <coughs> Board Commissioner that I almost printed out and, and, and brought with me today that talked about that specifically. And, um, and for non-accredited investors, there's a, a specific exemption, federal exemption that you mentioned it, it's Rule 504 under Regulation D, and it allows you to raise money um, with up to 35 non-accredited investors, and it caps it at a million dollars. You can't go above a million dollars. Um, but you can use that, and, and there are certain requirements you have to satisfy, but that's probably, uh, you know, that's kind of what I was imagining uh, today, is, is a, a, this group would maybe be most interested in, in that specific exemption, actually, because it allows you to use non-accredited investors, and you raise a million dollars, I mean, you can do a lot for a million dollars, I'd imagine, investing in the types of real estate properties that you guys are thinking about. Um, the, the more stringent requirement there, actually, is probably uh, complying with the state securities laws, because with 506, the accredited investor offerings, um, the states pretty much follow the federal rules, but with the non-accredited offerings of securities, they're, they're a little more all over the map. And so you, that's why you have to hire somebody like me to, to look at the laws of each state. I've got to go to the Arizona securities regulator, or whatever, whoever that is, and, and read about what the laws of the state of Arizona are and what they allow you to do with respect to these offerings to non-accredited investors. And, and you know, um, I guess there, it, really what, what the security, the Texas Securities Board looks at is kind of, this, it has a sophistication standard of the investor. And they've got net worth, you know, if you're investing less than 20% of your net worth, then, then you're okay. Um, but I, I don't have those specific rules. I can send them to you if you, if you contact me and, and then, um, but, but that's really it. That there are opportunities, there are ways to sell securities to non-accredited investors. And I don't know how much time we really have, Chanel, but it may be useful to, to go on to talk about the, the advertising or? Yes, I, I, okay. want you, I want you to talk about, talk about that. And, and I, I'll tell you that um, in confidence, and I'm not going to say who, but someone just told me that they have probably heard about you're not alone. You're not alone at all. <laughs> So this is a handout that I handed out to you, and these are updates since my, my law school lecture from uh, a year and a half ago. And, and what's happened is under the, the Jumpstart or Business Startups Act or Jobs Act, uh, there's there's been a new, two new, one new exemption that the, that the, I, that the FEC has allowed, and it allows now for uh, what the terminology is general solicitation or general advertising. And that just means like anything you could imagine as being advertising, you know, TV, newspaper, magazine, the internet, um, and then also general solicitation. I've invested you, I mean, I've invited you all here tonight to hear about my great investment opportunity. I put an ad in the newspaper, you know, I said 50% returns, come here, Roland Weider Andrews talk Thursday night. And so if you're all here, that's a general solicitation where I don't have personal relationships with any of you and um, I don't know, you know, what your status is as an investor. You may be the wealthiest person in the world. You may be the poorest. But um, I've invited you to come hear me talk about this investment opportunity. And what the SEC allows you to do now is to make a general solicitation or general advertising. I can take an I can take that ad out in the newspaper now. I may not want to 
say 50% return, but I'll say, hey, I've got a great investment opportunity for you, and uh, I want you to come and hear me talk about it. And then, you know, Larry comes up afterwards, or Shanoa comes up afterwards and says, hey, Roland, now I'm really interested in investing. Previously, I couldn't do that. But now I can, provided that Larry or Shanoa are accredited investors, and then I have to take some enhanced or additional steps to verify that they're accredited. Previously, I could just give Larry a questionnaire, and if he checks that box, saying that he's an accredited investor and signs it, that's all I need. I can take your money, I can use the exemptions that rely on um, you know, your status as, as an accredited investor and, and move on down the road. But if I use general solicitation or advertising, I have to verify. So I have to say, hey Larry, you know, I'm using an exemption now that requires me to, to scrutinize your, your check, check box a little more. I have to get a bank statement, I have to get a, a brokerage account statement a letter from your attorney or your accountant. And um, provided that you do that, and provided that you do that with all your investors, each and every one of them, then you can take out that ad in the newspaper, general solicitation advertising. And, that is huge. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll tell you though, that if you if you miss it, like if I forget to get that information from Larry, he just keeps putting me off, saying, oh yeah, well, I'll get to you, or, you know. If I don't get it, I busted that exemption and I've engaged in illegal offering of securities and and you know again like what what you mentioned or somebody else mentioned that you know gosh I've been doing this for years without complying with these laws you're not alone you know and what happens is when something goes wrong they sue you you know or, or call the securities board and say hey these guys you know, ripped me off um, and, and that's just one more one more thing. Not only do you have these angry investors, but you've got the securities regulated, regulators angry at you as well. And, and you, yeah, that's worse, definitely. But so so what I'll say is, well, I don't know, maybe not. It's kind of depends. But uh, um, I, I've talked with a lot of securities lawyers about this, and there aren't, and surprisingly, there aren't that many people <coughs> using that. And I, I'm not really sure why exactly, but I think part of it is that if I'm sponsoring this investment, I have to go to Larry and I have to say, man, I, I need you to disclose some information that, you know, I mean, you're willing to invest with me, but you, know, you may not want to give me that. It, it, I think it, it puts people, offerers, you know, companies that are trying to use that exemption, it puts them in kind of an uncomfortable place with their investors. Um, so, you know, it's out there, it's there. If you want to do that, if you want to take it out of the newspaper, I hope you do that, but I'm going to warn you, you know, of, of the challenges that we're going to face. Uh, a couple of hands, oh, yes, sir. You're saying you can only advertise to accredited investors. Well, you can advertise to everybody, but only investors that I accept that can actually, I can take money from, they have to be accredited, and I have to verify that they're accredited. So you could advertise, a general advertisement, other than accredited investors show up, you could maybe talk to them about some other kind of relationship. Right, and, and so there, um, that's another, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at the general advertising and solicitation test, um, one thing that, that the SEC looks at is if I've got a pre-existing relationship with the people that I've sent that email out to, out to, then it's okay. If you're my friend, and I know, you know, we've had a, some kind of relationship in the past. Hey man, I've got this new company, you might be interested in investing in it. You know, that's one of the, the things that the SEC looks at. But if we have no pre-existing relationship, and I've just taken an ad out in the newspaper, you know, that's a general solicitation advertising. And that's kind of the distinction. So, uh, yes, sir. But you did say they could, that you could accept a letter from an attorney or an accountant stating they meet these qualifications? Yeah. Or would they have to have bank statements to back it up? Well, I mean, the letter probably by itself, you know. And, Is and that it, adequate? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and if he says, so you, you could know, just list it out in the letter, have their attorney sign it, keep it on file, right. and they wouldn't have to be so yeah. exposed, if you will. That's right. And you yeah. can still do the deal. Yes, sir. So I have two questions. If you knew somebody, let's say we met people here, and it said the 10 of us get together and do a deal, and we all knew each other beforehand, how much know each other beforehand? 
solicitation and advertising. So if you've gone out and if I've never I'm pretty sure no one here has seen any of my advertisements anywhere. Uh, yeah, I'm not networking at all. So how much knowing do you have to know before it's considered illegal? Yeah, I mean if you and I met and I had a you know Larry and I met you this evening, we talked with you a little bit about it. And we're cool? Yeah, well, not, no, not necessarily. I would say that we would want to have that meeting, and then we really want to get to know you a little bit better, let time pass, maybe 30 days before we took your money. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. So if every one of my investors uh, are making money and they're happy, of course they're not going to be reporting me. Uh, what if someone's jealous and they say, hey, I know these guys are doing Or is it only the people who are in that? Uh, no, no, anybody can file a complaint with the securities board, even if you're not, if you just have knowledge of it. If somebody's come to me in the past for that. They said, hey, I know this guy's doing something illegal, and he had a beef with him. And he, he started to go through the process, and it's like, well, could they call me to testify? And like, maybe. SEC would be the way. Just a complaint from a, a competitor, and they never really did anything. Yeah. So, no, that's right. I mean, but, but, but that being said, I mean, post Madoff, they might want to do something. Yeah. But, you know. yeah, no, that's a really good point because the, the world has changed, and that was one of the big yeah. reasons. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think what you're, you took out an ad, somebody showed up, and you're like, I don't know if, if you're really a creditor or not, but well, let's get to know each other. You waited 30 days, and you kind of convert them over into somebody that you, you know, and, and so now you're not having to rely on, on C. Um, I would say the reason they showed up was because of your ad. You know, that's what a security regulator would probably say as well. You know, so if you do that, if you take out that advertisement, you know, that's just a, I mean, you, and, and I guess maybe you wait three years and, and it's an entirely different deal. You know, and I, I'm, I, I know the, the letter ruling that you mentioned, I, I recognize the title, I don't remember what it says specifically, but, or, or the, the SEC release, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not saying the right thing. But. Well, that's, a lot of the portals are relying on that 30 day cooling off period. The portals? That. Yeah. So, but they're not doing real general solicitation, they're doing quasi general solicitation. But yeah. Really great guys can look at our portal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's one way of doing it. But, you know, I'll just say, dang, as your attorney, I mean, there's risks there, but people, people are aggressive, right? And, and uh, you know, help me do it. Help me figure out how to do it without, you know, getting tired. The criteria for certification. For, uh, sorry, for an offering or? No, of course, for, for, for the, the investment. So you got credit. Oh, credit. So what is the yeah, so criteria for? Uh, yeah, so the accredited investor standards, and then just memorize these because they're not that difficult. And if you're thinking about doing this, you can just kind of rattle them off and tell people with a million dollars net worth, excluding the value of your principal residence, so your, your home, can't include that. Um, or 
if you made $200,000 in income by yourself or $300,000 with your spouse and you have a reasonable expectation of doing that in the future. So you're a credited investor at that point. So then it's just income based, not asset based at all? Right, just wow. income based. <clears throat> now also you said on part of the asset based requirement, did you specifically exclude uh, um, retirement or, or qualified funds? Or do you just say as a general? You know, no, the only exclusion for that is your principal residence, your house. Okay, that's live. the only legal specification. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what about if you don't solicit at all, maybe you think it's a great company idea, tell friends and family, word gets out, <coughs> credited investors come to you without having solicited, Are you, and, and you accept them <coughs> funding and you don't uh, get a letter from the attorney or CPA or something. Right there, I mean, if, if somebody's approached you like that, you know, then, then you establish that relationship. You have to form a reasonable belief that they're accredited. You know, it's like, check the box and sign it, that's it. But they didn't come to you through a general advertising. They reached out to you. So the requirement only is if you generally advertise, that they have to verify. Yeah, yeah or like, I mean, that term general, you know, applies to advertising Publicly. or solicitation, but you know, it's just like to a broad audience. I don't care who it is. I want as many people to know about this as possible. And then you have to verify. Right. But if it's just person to person, you don't. Right. Yeah. If you just meet somebody on the corner and you start talking to them, and you, hey, this guy might might be a good investor. You know, talk to him, get, him, get to know him a little better. Maybe wait 30 days before you take money from him. You know, you're okay. All right. One final question. That is on the income for 200,000. Can it be from any source, or does it have to be earned income? Uh, any source. Any source, yeah. okay. Sir. Uh, you mentioned is there any assumption with LinkedIn or Facebook as the piece of people that, is, is there any, is, is that maybe yeah. a pre-existing relationship? Oh, yeah, definitely. If you to them, you don't know them really well, can you put that on the list? Well, so so there, you know, I mean, I see I see deals coming through LinkedIn all the time, you know, great investment opportunity, and I mean, they're violating the, I mean, well, I mean not now necessarily, but I mean, it's just it's one one way that that you could say. I mean, are you talking about doing a general solicitation through LinkedIn or just correct? And let's yeah. say there's the 500 plus connections of those, a fraction would really be pre-existing relationship. Can you put that deal? only to be seen by the people following you on LinkedIn. I don't know, you know, if you asked me that as your attorney, I'd probably say, you know, whatever money you accept, make sure that person's accredited and get their bank statements. Yeah. Or the letter. Or the letter, yeah. Yes, sir. So you made reference to the reasonableness checks under 506 C earlier, and you know, you just gotta get a letter from a CPA or an attorney or whatever, kind of gloss over that, but it seems to me that a lot of the carriers that underwrite risk for those professionals are worried about these comfort letters. What is your experience with people actually issuing these comfort letters? None. Because I haven't represented anybody that's done general solicitation or advertising. <coughs> and I, I, you know, if I glossed over something, I mean, you're, you're obviously very educated, so I mean, you know, ping me. I mean, let me know what, what it is that you're thinking about, because I may have you know, not describe something accurately. It seems like a very practical problem. Because, oh, yeah. I mean, you're making the assumption that somebody's going to actually sign up to do this, but if their piano carriers won't allow them to do it, yeah. it's functionally irrelevant. Yeah. So, blow all of your teeth and to go and have to see folks, but then you can't reasonably verify them. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mean, You could. Well, I mean, you could give a brokerage account statement that shows that you've got a million dollars in Microsoft stock. So is he saying the letter is not sufficient? Well, no. What he's saying is that, like, all right. So you come to me and say, "Hey, well, I got to prove this. I, I got to prove to Larry that I'm accredited." So will you write me a letter? And so I think, okay, well, sure. How do I do that? I call my my malpractice liability carrier. I say, gosh, I've never run into this. This is a new rule. What do I have to do to make sure that you're actually accredited? 
They're like, you know, because if you're not, then, then what I've done is I've made a representation to Larry. And Larry's exemption is gone now. And, and that and comes back on your end, though, is it? Rescission. He's got to give you all your money back. And then Larry's looking at me, or somebody's looking at me for, you know, kind of suing under my policy. So I think that's what, what he was saying. It's just well, you know, for accountants. Yeah. You know, if they had an accountant, the accountant feels comfortable knowing that person's net worth. I don't see where there'd be issue. It's just a kind of a protection for that individual not to have to disclose all these accounts and stuff just to anybody. Yeah, yeah. So it just makes the deal a lot cleaner on the on the back end. But as far as an attorney or an accountant, they're gonna should know that client well enough to know if they genuinely. Yeah, it's just I guess what would happen is like they write that letter and the next day the guy goes out and goes oh, crazy wow. and sells everything and, and or whatever and you know I mean just whatever scenario you could imagine where you know, the person becomes non-accredited, and because of that, they lose their exemption, and there's a lawsuit, you know, suing me or the accountant. You could include in the statement as of this day. Yeah, know. yeah. No, you know, you're exactly I'm right. I'm thinking you draw up a form letter to begin with and just have the attorney sign and check the box. I'm, a, I'm an attorney or a CPA. And then my next final question was on that, was would it need to be notarized? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it's, I guess it's not. What, what notary stamp does is it just, if you ever have to, to prove the authenticity of a signature, right. you're going to call the notary, or you potentially could call the notary into the court and say, yes, I saw Joe Blow sign that document on August 21st. They go back and put it in the log and use it. Yeah, so maybe, maybe not. Would you sign a letter? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get somebody to pay me to research it. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, because the the one thing that I should really warn you about is, you know, and this is something that's useful to kind of bring all this home, is violations of securities laws are, are um, can have really bad re repercussions. And so there, there are two main things, bad things that can happen. Let's say that I, I put the ad in the newspaper and I don't verify that you're accredited, but I take your money anyway, I violate my exemption, and, and one of the things that a securities regulator can do or a court can make me do is to give that investor back all his money with interest. And that's called rescission. That's the rescission <coughs> remedy. And that's a pretty dramatic um, penalty. But then the other thing is if, if I'm guilty of securities fraud, and that might include you know, knowingly making an a unregistered offering, you know, I, I, I don't care. I'm just going to sell those, those limited partnership interests, and I know I'm violating the securities laws. Uh, you know, if, if the regulator could show that I made a, a knowing violation, or if I lied to you and I said, "Hey, you know, we're going to, I'm going to go out and buy this house with your money," but I really go and go to Vegas and lose it all, whatever. You know, I can be held personally liable for that. So I formed a company, right? You know, the reason why you form a company in the first place is to shield yourself from personal liability. So I think, oh, I can do anything, right? No. For securities laws, violations, the principles of the company, this is one of the instances, and there are other instances too where the principal of the company, the owner of the company, the people that run the company can be held personally liable for the violations of, of the law. And so I could be on the hook for giving you back all your money plus interest, personally. So that's that's one thing to really keep in mind when you're, you know, that's why why I'm really a lot more important than I think a lot of people are getting hurt. So, <laughs> 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 so you about crowdfunding. Okay, yeah, so, so this is the other thing that's on the sheet. And um, crowdfunding, you know, the, I, I, I was doing a little research and, and you, you see this term used oh. in a lot of different ways, but traditionally really what it is is where you know, like the, the thing that I'm interested in, I saw recently, and I want to save some money to, is these guys in, uh, developing a new game. It's like a board game. And I was like, oh, that looks like it'd be fun for me to play with my kids. And so if you give them $35, you know, they've got their target. We've got to raise $50,000. And if you give now, you know, the first, you know, whatever, 1,000 people, right? Or, yeah. Or, or, yeah, Kickstarter. Well, I guess, you know, yeah, all that stuff. Where, I'm, I'm not, so they're gonna take that game, they're gonna eventually go out and sell it to Target, Walmart, make millions of dollars through Amazon or whatever. But now, all they're doing is they're just raising the development costs 
And what I get in return isn't a share of stock in the company that's making the game. What I get is the game. You know, it's just, it looks cool, and I get the first one because I gave you $35. So that's really traditionally crowdfunding. You're not buying a security there. You're, you're getting, it's more like a, I mean, there's, I think there's something in here that describes it specifically, but, but uh, um, I guess that's one way that it's, it's really used. Another way is just, it's a small company uh, offering exemption. And you look down here and it, it's just going to be a, a, another way for you to raise money uh, from non-accredited investors and using these portals. And, and I guess I'd let you read, read about it here. And it's not particularly relevant right now because the SEC hasn't finalized the rules regarding this. And so, you know, they, they've got some proposed rules out now regarding this, and that's what's described here. You'll see proposed SEC crowdfunding rules. Uh, but until they're finalized, you can't rely on them. And, and I'll tell you, you know, and you know, they talk about these portals, uh, the crowdfunding platforms, and that's going to be one of the requirements as well. Um, and I imagine it's something like whatever you, you were talking about is uh, IPO net or the website, I mean, it's probably gonna be something like that. There's gonna be some kind of registration requirement for those types of portals, kind of like a broker dealer. But uh, I, I guess, you know, for the crowdfunding stuff, it's just really think about it as a way for you to, to raise money from non-accredited investors um, in a different way than you can do it now. And there are actually probably more limitations, there may be more limitations in terms of uh, the, the restrictions are, down here at the bottom of page two, investors over the course of a 12 month period could invest up to $2,000 of 5% of their annual income or net worth, whichever is greater, or 10% of their annual income or net worth, which is ever, whichever is greater, either their annual income or net worth is equal to or more than $100,000. So, you know, just read that, but right now it's it's not, not really relevant because the rules aren't fine. Yeah, yeah, and then I was kind of getting back to uh, Joan's point is uh, that's kind of what I imagine would be the typical deal that you guys would be thinking about putting together. And uh, there, just think about these kind of some, some key numbers, 35 investors, a maximum of 35 investors if you, if you have non-accredited investors, and the maximum amount that you can raise is a million dollars. That's kind of a real simple way of doing it. 35 investors, yeah. a cap a million, and they don't have to be accredited. Right. And that's Texas. I'm just assuming that you have only Texas investors. You know, and, and everything I say, whenever I give you like a two line summary of, of what the rule is, I mean, just know that there's a whole, you got to you know, read the rest of the book to really not understand, <laughs> you know, but, but that's a good, pretty good summary of, of what you can do. Yes, sir. It's called the million dollar limit. So I can understand if one partnership could be a million dollars. Because you do one in January and you do one in February. It's a partnership, right? Yeah. If you have different entities, you may have more flexibility there. But what the SEC could do, there's a, a integration doctrine, is what they call it. And if you do two offerings within six months of each other, then they combine them into one. And that may be what happens. If they see, oh, this guy's just doing this to get around the securities laws, they're going to combine them and say, no, you. You really it's just one offering. If there were different properties. Yeah, if there were different properties then, then I would say it'd be pretty hard to argue that they're the same offering. Yeah. Oh I thought he was asking about different will you give us um, will you give us number one, will you give us your closing arguments? <laughs> and then number two, um, can can uh, the people who have more questions for you, can they um, meet you and me for a drink later at a point a place to be named in like twenty minutes? Yeah, yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, that sounds great. So, closing so I guess in closing, one thing I'd, I'd like to do is just maybe tell you a little bit about, I mean, I, you know, there, this is a big area of the law, and, and each situation is different, and, and it's a changing area of the law, and, and gentlemen back in the blue shirt, 
I mean, I'd love to talk with you more because, you know, I can tell you, you've got, you know, some things you're thinking about that, you know, you, you guys, you know, the, the, the variations of the business uh, world, you know, every circumstance is different. So we just have to talk with each of you and tell you, yeah, you can do this, no, you can do that. But what I wanted to tell you about in the beginning, I was kind of nervous, but I forgot, is, you know, I want to tell you about my firm. I joined a, a law firm about a year and a half ago. It was right after I, I spoke at this meeting last, and that's the contact information on the back, and um, Moster, Wynn, Ressler, and, um, and I, I, I'm a lot more equipped now than I have been in the past, just because I've got a team around me, and, um, and we've got a real estate attorney now, so, you know, I, I could, I, I've done, I've represented lots of clients that have invested in real estate in the past myself, and I'm a passful real estate attorney myself, but there's some real estate law work that I want to do, and I always hire real estate attorneys, but now I've got one in the office next to me. His name is Keith Sherry. Um, and then uh, I share an office with uh, a litigation specialist, Lance Hevesy, and um, if you need to sue anybody or you're being sued, I couldn't recommend anybody more highly than Lance. Uh, so, you know, just, just a little pitch from my firm. Love to talk with you. You've got my contact information here. Um, I've got a few business cards I can give, give out, and um, you know, we'll be available definitely to answer questions. So thank you so much. You know, this is great. Uh, thank you all.